The Modern Pain Podcast is a proud member of the PT Podcast Network. Make sure you check out ptpodcastnetwork.com for other awesome PT-related podcasts. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Modern Pain Podcast. This week, we're talking with a physician colleague, Dr. Linda Bluestein. It's always great to get the physician perspective and also to see a physician who really gets persistent pain in chronic conditions. Dr. Bluestein will share her journey with Ehlers-Danlos from her days as a ballet dancer to a patient in physical therapy to where her case wasn't fitting normal pathways. We discuss her views on Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, POTS, and mast cell activation syndrome, and she's going to drop a ton of good nuggets around these topics, which you're all going to get some serious value from. With that said, enjoy the episode. This is the Modern Pain Podcast with Mark Cargilla. Dr. Bluestein, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to have you on the podcast. It's always good to have our physician colleagues on the podcast. You were a uh, result of me looking at Twitter and also being very frustrated with our lack of really knowledge on the ehlers Danlos front and mast cell activation syndrome and POTS. We had one of our uh, colleagues, Abby Gordon, came on who works with a lot of EDS patients and kiddos mainly at Seattle Children's. But I'm excited to have a physician perspective on today because it's, it's one that I think a lot of clinicians can benefit from as far as better understanding these conditions that are, I don't, they're, they're new as far as maybe being better recognized. And we were talking before the podcast, I think we all can probably go back in time to when we were growing up and had friends who were probably significantly hypermobile and doing things that now looking back was probably EDS or related syndromes or hypermobility syndromes. So uh, we'll get into that a little bit, but before we do, if you don't mind introducing yourself, Dr. Bluestein, and uh, let folks know your journey to where you're at today. Sure, sure. So my name is Linda Bluestein, and I started out wanting to be a professional ballet dancer, like, of course, so many young ladies. And I started to get a lot of joint pain in my um, early teens and started to run into more and more health problems and realized pretty quickly that I needed a plan B. And that plan B turned out to be going into medicine. And I worked as an anesthesiologist for over 20 years in the operating room before my health started to catch up to me again. And then I needed to come up with a plan C. And in the course of trying to figure out how to improve my own health, along the way, I discovered that I had um, hypermobile EDS or hypermobile Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. And I had done so many different things that had Im drastically improved my pain, my functional capacity, my quality of life. And a decade ago, when I was in my 40s, I was so much less well than I am now a decade later. So people finally convinced me to open a practice so that I could teach some of what I had learned and help people navigate the process. Because as you said, it's less well recognized than it should be, or they should be, I should say, because this is a group of conditions, right? And um, so basically, that's how I ended up doing what I'm doing. It was not really a planned thing. <laughs> so did you feel like you self-treated yourself mainly, or did you have some like physician colleagues and folks that were able to kind of help you along the journey? 100% treated myself. 100%. I mean, I wasn't writing myself prescriptions, but I was I did, you know, um, alter my diet and my activity and my mindset and, you know, learned a lot about catastrophization and obviously tons of physical therapy. That was crucial, absolutely crucial. I consider myself a lifer and I've been in and out of physical therapy since I was probably 13 or so. And it's one of those diagnoses we're definitely seeing more commonly in physical therapy clinics. And I think more commonly just recognized as Ehlers Danlos. I think even recalling, I've been in practice for 20 plus years now, and I definitely have patients that it was just hypermobility. And now that we're better recognized, I would bet that a lot of those folks were dealing with some of those uh, recognized syndromes that we now are better understanding, hopefully. And after this podcast, you can understand a little bit better. Uh, I'm wondering if you can maybe d discuss a little bit for the audience about kind of Maybe the, you know, Ehlers-Danlos, you don't have to go into a full like dissertation topic, you know, discussion on it, but just enough to kind of give folks a, a, a good kind of view of Ehlers-Danlos, kind of what it looks like when it's coming in clinical doors. And then I'd love if you can touch upon a little bit of that grouping of other conditions that often accompany it a little bit. Sure. So the Ehlers-Danlos syndromes is actually a group of conditions, and there are uh, currently 14 different subtypes. And each of the subtypes are fairly different from each other, or at least some of them are quite different from other ones. But there's one subtype that's by far the most common, and that's the hypermobile subtype. And these are what we call hereditary disorders of connective tissue. So they are 
problems with your genetic makeup, and then probably there's some environmental factors as well, but they're genetic conditions. They're not um, you know, uh, secondary or acquired conditions like lupus or rheumatoid arthritis or something like that that can also affect the connective tissue, but those conditions are acquired. The Ehlers-Danlos syndromes are genetic. And so they affect um, usually uh, three hallmark signs that we look for, which are joint hypermobility or greater than expected range of motion of the joints. And then we also see skin changes. So like skin hyperelasticity, um, we'll see like abnormal scarring and things like that. And then thirdly, we will see um, weak tissues. So tissue fragility or, you know, things, uh, easy bruising, um, tissues that tear easily, um, pelvic organ prolapse, things like that. And it's one of those things like, as you mentioned, hasn't been well recognized in the past. Um, so those are maybe some clues that, that a, a you know, physiotherapist, physical therapist can kind of see as they're coming into the clinic is some of these things. And I know for, for those of you practicing, you know, the Biden scale is probably one of the, the hallmark tests of, of how we kind of determine if they're meeting this criteria for hypermobility. But often you, you can see it just with, you know, visual range of motion assessments and different things that can give you a clue to, to what's going on. With your expertise, obviously as a physician, but also as a physical therapy patient, I'm wondering if you could talk to you a little bit about where you see physical therapy's role being um, in this condition and like how it's best helped you kind of navigate things as you've gotten better over the last decade, better managing things. Well, it was my physical therapist who said to me, I think there's something else going on here. And she said, you know, you are very hypermobile. This was, you know, like a decade ago. And I had had a Tarlov cyst, which um, it can be associated with connective tissue disorders. And so she knew that also about me. And she said, I really think that you need to get assessed for a connective tissue disorder or some explanation for why you get injured very easily. You have a lot of joints that sublux and um, you've had a lot of, you know, tendinopathies and different slow to heal injuries and things like that. And so I'm so grateful to her because if it wasn't for her, I don't know how much longer I would have gone on before getting a proper evaluation. And it's, it's signs of a good clinician when the, when the pieces aren't adding up to start looking at some other, op, uh, you know, options or other possible differentials. So um, what were the, the main signs? I mean, it sounds like obviously multiple injuries and different things like that. Um, Clinically, how do you feel? What has been the best things that you found to manage it, like from a physical therapy standpoint? Like what, what interventions seem to be, you know, we, we talk about stabilization exercise and different things. I'm just curious, what, what, what's your routine that you find from a physical therapy perspective? I know you mentioned yourself as a lifer, and I, I have a few folks that, you know, come in because unfortunately that hypermobility doesn't go away and sometimes subluxations and flares can, can, can happen. So it's good to have somebody on your healthcare team that can kind of navigate some of those flares when they happen. I'm just curious what's been most helpful for you. So, so right. So I'll be, uh, have a new injury or a new problem. And even though maybe I know what some of the exercises are, I won't know the, the right sequence or I won't know where to start, or maybe I need them to do some soft tissue mobilization, some dry needling, something like that, that really can help jumpstart the process. And of course, the physical therapist is going to watch how I move. They're going to do their detailed assessment, which is so helpful. I can't do that on myself. Like I, you know, I don't know how to do that. So I think that, um, you know, having them watch and look for certain of these variables and then letting me know, okay, this is where we, we should start. And uh, because I didn't realize, it may sound funny, but it was like a decade ago that I first heard that you can do a movement using the wrong muscles. I'd never heard that before. Like I didn't realize that that was a thing and I didn't realize how important neuromuscular patterns were. So really having somebody touching you on different muscles and saying, now try to work this muscle as compared to that other one. And so I think that's been just tremendously helpful for me. I think recognizing with the hypermobility that there can be some some protective movement patterns that you have when you're in pain that may not serve the best interest of overall function and then trying to retrain and start getting into more movement patterns that maybe go away from that protective behavior to get to more fluid movements that are keeping joints in a maybe more friendly position. Yeah, that can be um, a big game changer. Now, with your practice, um, what are, what are the common things you see? I know, you know, for physical therapists, we do have direct access. So sometimes we'll see folks who come in off the street, um, you know, maybe have had various things and have often had a 
frustrating journey when they're EDS patients that haven't been diagnosed yet. I'm curious, what are the common threads you see with the general, and this isn't just physician population, like I said, I think it's a, a, a symptom of healthcare as a whole, not quite understanding this condition as well as probably we should. What, what are, what's the common journeys you see with folks who are struggling with this that are coming into your clinic to first be diagnosed? Oh, yeah. It's a, there's a very common picture that I see where they've just been struggling with various different symptoms. Usually it's joint pain, gastrointestinal symptoms, maybe it's either a mild or more moderate degree of some orthostatic intolerance often, maybe some allergy or atopy type signs. And they've often gone from practitioner to practitioner and nobody's put these different things together because a lot of times the like the non-GI doctors are like, as soon as you start to talk about GI things, nope, that's really not my wheelhouse. <laughs> so, you know, a lot of people don't listen to all of the different symptoms that a person might be experiencing. Some are neurologic, some are gastrointestinal, some are cardiac, you know, some are musculoskeletal. Um, and so I think it's very common for people to be dismissed inappropriately. And then a lot of people also have poor sleep um, and that can contribute, you know, you hear about pain somnia, right? And so people are in pain, so they don't sleep well, which makes their pain worse, which makes it harder to sleep. And that makes their pain worse and it turns into a vicious cycle. And of course, the exact same thing happens with anxiety. You have pain and that makes you anxious, which makes you have more pain, which makes you more anxious. So we get vicious cycles with that as well and with depression. So I feel like there's a lot of vicious cycles that happen that if people would be offered care, validation, recognition at an earlier point in time, we could prevent some of those downstream consequences that can take a lot of time to undo. hundred percent agree with you. It's, it's frustrating when you hear stories of patients who come in who've been kind of dismissed, like you said, and invalidated and kind of brushed aside because it didn't make kind of maybe the black and white sense. But also you, you mentioned some of the symptoms of our healthcare system where we're so compartmentalized of like this all just sees your, your GI symptoms, this all just sees your neurologic systems. Yet I, I always say we have too many folks focusing on the tree and nobody focusing on the forest, but obviously folks like yourself are doing a great job being maybe that more ecosystem forest, you know, evaluator to kind of put the pieces together. Cause uh, what's been your experience with some of those aha moments that people have when they finally feel like somebody puts the pieces together of all these ologist trees. And then how's that been for you and your experience in your practice? What's amazing to me is uh, a lot of people, they just want to be heard. Like there's so much that even just happens in the process of my in initial intakes are between one and a half and three and a half hours long. And that's face to face time. That doesn't include the time beforehand and the time afterwards that I spend reviewing records or writing the note, et cetera. So it's, um, you get to know a person very well, of course, if you spend that much time with them face to face. And so I feel like that often even just helps jumpstart their healing journey. And I'm oftentimes, as we were talking about before we started recording, I'm oftentimes saying, well, maybe we should get rid of some of these medications. Maybe we should get rid of some of these supplements because some of what you're experiencing could be side effects from some of these things that you're taking rather than trying to just add on more things. I mean, I have people who they're taking like 30 supplements. That's a problem. That's, that is definitely a problem. <laughs> Yeah. And it seems like when we, when you see all these like symptoms that again, nobody's connecting the dots on, everybody has the supplement for that one symptom. And then with a lot of these complex conditions, there's a multitude of symptoms across a multitude of body systems. So there's no shortage of, of reasons to take very, again, narrow viewing supplements when, you know, we probably need a more big picture approach with folks. Where do you stand with like lifestyle medicine approaches when it comes to, to working with folks uh, in like the EDS spectrums and hypermobility syndromes? Where do you feel that type, type of approach fits? Oh, I think it's absolutely huge. I think it's absolutely critical. I know for me, when I, uh, I believe, was this before? No, it was after I was diagnosed. But I came across some lectures on central sensitization, catastrophization, and I realized, wow, what I think up here can really impact how I feel. And that's something that I can control. I can control my thoughts and I can control how I eat and how much I move. Because I think what often happens is when we hurt ourselves doing minor movements, then it makes us more and more afraid to move. 
And so what I see a lot is young people who are spending most of the day in bed. And now in some cases, maybe there's really nothing that could be done to prevent that because maybe they're so sick and they have such severe problems. But in some of these cases, I really believe that there are ways that they could have prevented that severe decline in their physical capacities. Because once you get basically bedridden, it's like really hard, obviously, to undo that deconditioning. So I have an acronym that I use for my treatment approach, and it's MENS, P-M-M-S. Have you ever heard me talk about this? I, I think I've come across it, but I, I'd love to hear you, hear you go into it. Okay. So the first M stands for movement. So whether it's PT, OT, getting in a pool, working with a Pilates instructor, going for walks in the neighborhood, it's moving more and moving better. So um, there's three M's in this acronym, but the first one is movement because that is so absolutely essential. Um, the E stands for education. I feel that people really benefit from learning pain neuroscience education, and then they understand how pain processing works and how it's not just a straightforward, like, especially with chronic pain, right? With acute pain, it's different. But with chronic pain, pain does not equal damage. There's a lot of other variables in there, right? So it's very important for people to understand how that works. N stands for nutritional biochemistry. So I, I take a nutrition intake and I talk to people about how we can alter what they're eating to decrease levels of inflammation, potentially decrease levels of mast cell degranulation and things like that. And then the S stands for sleep. Um, a lot of my patients are sleeping very, very poorly. So we work on improving their quality of sleep and sleeping at the right time. I've had patients that are going to sleep at 6 a.m. And they're not working a night shift, by the way. Um, they're just going to bed that late. So I think it's really important for people to be sleeping when it's dark out and be awake when it's light out whenever possible, because that circadian cycle is so important. The P stands for psychosocial. I believe that everyone deserves to have a uh, counselor of some sort to work with if they possibly can. And I understand not everyone can afford that, but there are fortunately some really great apps and things out there that people can avail themselves of. And some people have not very supportive relationships in their lives. So sometimes they have to evaluate that. And I've had people say, I've learned I have to love my family from afar because they weren't those relationships were not supportive of me. And so, you know, kind of working through some of those things and figuring out how you can get those needs met. And we know a lot of people have trauma in their histories as well, which is, of course, an important thing to address. Um, so that's the P. Uh, the next S, no, wait, P, M, M, S, yes. So the next letter is M, which stands for modalities. So that could be, um, you know, uh, oh, I've got right here a light therapy device that I'm using on my shoulders right now. Um, so it could be something like that. It could be, uh, you know, uh, acupuncture, acupressure, various different, you know, massage, not different modalities like that. Then the next M stands for medications. Notice that is the last of the three M's, medications. And then the very last letter S is for supplements. So those two things are at the end for a reason. Sounds like a great framework and obviously working well for a lot of people in your practice. Um, you mentioned like you're noticing of <clears throat> in your own situation, you know, pain catastrophization, how thoughts can influence things. That's always a delicate discussion because, you know, a lot of patients, you know, start hearing you bring that into the treatment room and into the conversation and, and some jump to, especially maybe after a history of invalidation and maybe some folks accusing them of being whatever malingerer, symptom magnifiers, whatever terrible thing we've accused people of in the past. But <clears throat> excuse me, how have you found that conversation? Is there any things you would tips or things you feel like has been helpful to help people connect the dots of how I think and my fears and anxieties and thoughts around my condition have can negatively impact things? How do you find anything that you found helpful to help people not hear you say this is in your head? Of course, that's not what we're saying. But, you know, it's hard for people, especially when the messaging around pain traditionally is like, throw your x-ray up there, throw your MRI up there, and let's make sense of your pain through that, which is obviously a very reductionist thing that takes, doesn't take into account all the multitude of things that you've already spoke to um, so far. But I'm curious if you have any pointers or things you found successful when you navigate that conversation. So I don't lead with that, first of all. 
Um, because of, you're right, it's a very, very delicate conversation. And I feel it's really important for people first to feel like I heard them. And in some cases, you know, they've been in pain since they were like five or, you know, some really young age. And so that's a lot of, that's a lot of years of alteration of the nervous system and affects their development. And I mean, it's just amazing all the different aspects of our lives that being in pain will, will, you know, impact. Right. So I try to explain to people that, you know, part of how I learned these things is through my own experimentation with my own self and my own body. And I went through a period where I was in so much pain. All I could talk about 24 seven was my pain. In fact, it's amazing. I'm still married because my husband was like so tired of hearing about it. And, and we actually went through a rough period because, you know, he's a physician. He was working full time. I was working full time. We had little kids at home and I didn't realize how much I was, you know, in this rumination type cycle and how much anxiety I had and poor sleep and all of that. And it, it took getting to a place where I could kind of receive that information and realize, like I said, it's, it's not a surgery where you have, you know, real potential complications, changing the way you think and trying to change your thoughts can benefit you in a lot of ways. So this is an approach that I feel can be really beneficial for a lot of people. And it benefited me a lot. And and I do this in combination with a lot of other things, of course, and I try to use my words very carefully. And I think probably there's some people that maybe they do leave that first appointment feeling that that, that was not a helpful conversation to have. I try to, I try to see how receptive they are to various p- bits and pieces of information, right? And I try to um, guide my discussion accordingly. And, you know, some people are ready for that information right away and other people are, are not. So it's, it is very, very challenging. And, you know, you said about people thinking that like we might be saying it's all in your head at the end of the day, everything that we feel is up here, right? So our tissues don't actually, I mean, yes, our tissues can generate pain signals that go up into our central nervous system, but but this is where we feel it and this is where we process it. And there's so many parts of the brain that are involved in pain processing, including the amygdala, the fear center of the brain. And so, you know, I try to explain to people it's physiologic, not psychiatric. So when we're under stress, a lot of things physiologically happen in the body, including when we're stressed, mast cells degranulate more. So learning to control our stress and learning how to modify um, some of these like lifestyle things can be hugely beneficial, not just for these conditions, of course, but for many aspects of our lives. I like how you tie that to the immune system and, and mast cell, you know, and we know, and I'd love to talk a little bit about mast cell activation syndrome because it's you bring up a great example of how thoughts catastrophizing things that generate, you know, huge upticks in our stress systems predisposes to the granulation of those mast cells and inflammatory dysregulation all throughout the body. I'm wondering if you can touch a little bit upon for folks that aren't aware of what even maybe mast cell activation syndrome is, and then maybe expound a little bit on how you kind of address that as part of a management of a patient with that. So, I honestly, even though I'm an anesthesiologist and I dealt with, you know, anaphylactic type reactions or allergic reactions related to medications in the operating room, I didn't know what mast cell activation syndrome was when I first started, you know, writing papers about these conditions and things like that. And so in 2017, when I opened my clinic, I knew a little bit about them, but not a lot. And I really, over the years, I have altered my approach very much to incorporate more treatments directed at mast cells, which are a part of the immune system. And they react appropriately when we have a a pathogen. So, you know, whether it's a virus or a parasite or whatever, they're supposed to react. And they can become, though, hyperactive. So they can end up reacting inappropriately to all kinds of things, pressure, cold, heat, foods, you know, Uh, some people end up having reactions to just a ton of different things. And the goal isn't necessarily to avoid every single trigger because some triggers like exercise, 
you know, are things that we want you to be able to do, but it is to figure out what triggers that mast cell degranulation. So I should back up too. mast cells contain inside of them hundreds of um, contents and people are probably most familiar with histamine, right? And um, so histamine we know causes allergic type type reactions in the, um, so they'll, you know, uh, you'll get like a rash or, you know, hives, um, you get itching, of course, and, uh, you know, various different reactions like that. So mast cells are involved in allergic type reactions, but they're also involved in things like irritable bowel syndrome. They're involved in migraine. They're involved in chronic pain. So they're very much involved in central sensitization and peripheral sensitization. So if we can decrease this mast cell hyperactivity and not just the histamines, but all of these chemicals that are having a range of effects all throughout the body, we can often dramatically lower someone's symptom burden and improve their quality of life. I think that whole topic of this whole neuroimmune interface and things, we had Mark Hutchinson, who's a pretty high level researcher over in Australia, who's working with like David Butler, Laura Mosley. I'm trying to help connect the dots from that kind of, you know, focus to pain and all these different things. And I, I think we're just scratching the surface on better understanding these things. And we've also had some, some folks on that talk about like more precision biologics uh, as far as like really being able to, look at somebody's almost pain phenotype and and specific kind of current biology and really have more targeted medications that are a medication that only works for that person or, or specifically tailored um, for that person. I'm curious what your thoughts are on kind of the future of that and where you see that as far as helping people with some of these chronic conditions. Well, we definitely have come a long way in terms of like the pharmacogenomic testing that we can do so we can get an idea of, you know, is this somebody, uh, codeine is a perfect example. We don't all metabolize codeine the same way. That's a drug that is very uh, differently metabolized in different people. And in fact, children should not be receiving codeine at all because of the fact that they metabolize it so differently. And there are many other drugs that like... um uh, psychoactive drugs that definitely can influence uh, people differently. Some people are rapid metabolizers of certain drugs, slow metabolizers of other drugs. So I could see a time where, you know, you take that information, which, you know, right now you kind of have to take those reports a little bit with a grain of salt. It's like, this is a piece of information. Um, but I could see a time where maybe we have even more in-depth information with those reports and putting that together with maybe some of the clinical history. I've tried this medication and this medication, and maybe I had side effects at a typical dose, or I had to take a higher dose in order to get an effect. But I think that precision medicine is definitely the way of the future. I mean, looking at SNPs, single nucleotide polymorphisms, there are companies that do not just the pharmacogenomic portion of that, but they will look at anesthesia panels. They will look at entire panels directed towards vitamin D metabolism, for example. We know vitamin D is very important for mood, pain, sleep, um, et cetera. So that's a really important one as well. Uh, one of the companies that I work with, they have hundreds and hundreds of maybe even thousands now of different SNPs that they look at. So these single nucleotide polymorphisms are just, you know, the base pairs like they would say, well, normally most people have CG and in your case, you had AT. So like that's, you look to see, well, what percentage of the population has that variant? It's not a mutation. It's not, a, it's not an extra copy of a gene. It's just a different base pair. So you look to see how often does that happen? What are the potential implications? And then you have to put it together with all the other information that you have. But I can see that being really helpful in the future. You pair that up with like AI kind of mechanisms and things where you can take all this gargantuan, the human genome and be, you know, all these different pieces of data that are, you know, beyond probably a normal human's ability to comprehend and punch that data together. But I, I think it'll be fascinating. Part of me is like, you know, I just see some folks, especially who are struggling with some of these chronic pain things and living in an environment that is so unstable to where their biology is fluctuating from day to day because it's not living in an environment that engenders stability and, and those type of things. So I, 
it'll be interesting to see where it goes. I mean, I think obviously I'm, I'm you know, rooting for that to, to take off and really um, do some amazing things. And we'll have to see what the future holds with that. You, you spoke a bit about you know, some of the orthostatic challenges that some of the patients have that you see. And POTS is definitely something that postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome uh, is one that we're seeing more in physiotherapy clinics. And, and one that I definitely hear clinicians kind of sometimes like, gosh, I don't know what to do. Where do I start? What do I, what's the, you know, background of this condition? I wonder if you could kind of speak to that, what you see in your practice and what you found helpful for those folks to maybe who are navigating, you know, and I know there can be varying degrees of how severe and, and it is for some people, but I'm curious what you found in your practice to be most helpful for those type of patients. Sure. So we know that it's more common than average for people who have either um, one of the forms of EDS or hypermobility spectrum disorder it's more common for them to have dysfunction of the autonomic nervous system. And the autonomic nervous system is what regulates your heart rate, your blood pressure, the size of your pupils, your digestion, like all the things that you don't think about in your body, your breathing, for example. And so when that becomes dysregulated, uh, sometimes what happens is when you go from sitting to standing or lying down to standing up, your, uh, your blood pressure will, if it stays the same and your heart rate accelerates quite remarkably, then that would fit the criteria for POTS or postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. A lot of people that have that condition, they have uh, severe intolerance of being upright. They'll have like heat and cold intolerance and um, a variety of other symptoms. Gastroparesis, for example, they don't move food well through their digestive tract and things like that. It is challenging if they're coming to, you know, physical therapy and maybe they haven't been diagnosed at because, and so they haven't had any treatments recommended to them. Um, definitely, you know, hydration is an important thing to consider because, you know, we need to have adequate intravascular volume. And this is where people who it's not necessarily the cause of it, but if they've become deconditioned, then that will contribute because we know that veins don't have muscles in the wall of them. So we need the the surrounding muscles to contract and push the blood from the lower extremities up towards the central circulation and have enough blood volume to go up into the head so we don't have brain fog, dizziness, et cetera. So if we can do some uh, kind of strength training, a little bit of cardio, start low and go slow, um, those kind of things are really, really important. Um, sometimes we do need to prescribe medications for for POTS, um, and it can be a very low dose of a beta blocker. It can be something called evabradine, which can help lower the heart rate. Um, sometimes clonidine, if somebody's, especially if they have what looks like more like what's called hyperadrenergic POTS. So when they stand up, their blood pressure actually goes up. And so that can be um, a condition where clonidine might be more effective. Um, a drug called mitodrine is also sometimes helpful for those patients. Um, and that can help kind of uh, clamp down those blood vessels and keep more of the blood in the central circulation. That's kind of a tricky one because you can't lay down within a few hours of taking it. So people have to be kind of upright and active or else they're going to get hypertension when they lay down. No, it is a challenging po uh, population as far as, again, not as well understood. It's nice though when I, I have some physician colleagues in the Phoenix area where I practice who are very up with it. And when you're getting kind of reinforcing messages from physicians and then the physiotherapist who's gonna reinforce the message where sometimes folks just haven't had any messages around it. And then the thought of exercising with a condition where their heart rate feels like it's going through the roof just with standing up, it's a hard, sometimes a hard sell. Um, so it takes a lot of education and things, but when that's happening on the front end and from the whole team, it's just so much more convenient and so much more helpful for the patient to kind of come on board with it. But I would agree going slow, uh, Abby Gordon, our physio we had on a few weeks back was talking about, you know, even just getting ankle pumps, if that's all we can start with, just to start pumping that blood from the periphery into the central, you know, circulation and hopefully up to the brain to help them with some of those things. It's somewhere to start where you can get people in. Uh, what do you find like from like just some of the autonomic things that we can do to influence our autonomic systems with like diaphragmatic breathing, meditation, mindfulness? Where do you feel those things fit? Oh, definitely. Because anything that we can do to activate the parasympathetic nervous system, the rest, digest, restore part of the nervous system that is in balance with the sympathetic nervous system, the fight, flight, or freeze nervous system, which is hyperactive usually in a case of POTS. So if we can activate that parasympathetic nervous system by working on various different breathing modalities that 
you know, there's all kinds of obviously books and, you know, uh, programs that you can purchase that will work you through different um, breathing, t- you know, strategies and things like that. I think those are really, really helpful. Meditation, guided imagery, all of that stuff I think is really great. And you're right with the exercises, it can be so small. Like I know Mayo Clinic calls it the L1 maneuver. Maybe other people call it the L1 maneuver too, but you know, just even squeezing your butt cheeks together before you stand up can help get the blood flowing more. And then when you go to stand up, you know, hopefully that will help you become a little bit less dizzy. Sometimes compression stockings can help. But um, with the exercise, what I usually tell people is if you can start with something seated, so whether it's a rowing machine or a recumbent bike, that often can be uh, very beneficial. So you're not starting with a higher heart rate because you're trying to be upright. There's some there's some protocols. Various folks have come up with protocols with that, coming from laying to seated to working up to. It's it's a graded progression, which we're trained in with physical therapy we're just so used to starting at a much maybe higher level that you just got to think of the same thing just bring it way down to like we're going to exercise just in supine and it might be ankle pumps and then we're going to work to doing some of these blood pumping strategies before we try to change position just like you said to kind of hopefully mitigate some of those negative impacts of the orthostasis and, and different challenges that folks have when they come up to upright so yeah no that's that's been something that's been definitely very helpful in my practice to start working with some of those autonomic training things along with some of the exercises you speak of. Um, I'd love to talk a little bit about your practice as a whole, because I I know you kind of have a a very specialized practice up there in Colorado, um, but you also do some coaching too. I'd love if you could kind of talk a little bit about how you are helping folks in this uh, situation. Sure. So I I started my practice in 2017. Obviously that was pre-COVID. My husband was, is also a physician and he was planning to retire. And so I moved from one facility to another because I needed more space and everyone was getting seen in person and everything was going great. And then COVID happened and I knew we were going to be moving anyway. So I ended up closing my practice and then uh, transitioning it to online at the beginning of COVID. Pretty much everything was online. Moved to Colorado. Now I have kind of a hybrid type model where if you can travel to see me in person in Colorado or Wisconsin, you can become a patient. I can write prescriptions. I can order lab tests. I can order imaging, you know, the whole spectrum of things that people normally think of. Um, I can make diagnoses, et cetera. But for a lot of people, number one, that travel is very expensive. And number two, They don't need that whole range of things. I feel like I can do the detective work that maybe their primary care doctor doesn't have the time to do. So if they see me on the uh, Bendy Bodies platform or the online coaching platform that I have, I can write detailed notes and I just write things like I was writing it in a book. So I won't say you should take XYZ medication. Instead, I will write some people with blank benefit from blank. So I'll write it like that. And then I tell them, share this with your doctor. And um, in many cases, I'll end up, you know, speaking with their doctor and they'll ask some questions. And usually they're happy to write for whatever, if I did recommend some medications, but I can do lots of education that way. It's cheaper for me to deliver that type of care because I don't have to pay rent anywhere. The insurance is less expensive. Um, I can I can squeeze those visits in a lot more easily in between podcast interviews and things like that. So um, so I, I really like doing that because I feel like it's a very cost effective way to help people. And I've seen people from all over the world. I've seen people from not every country, of course, but from many many different countries and time zones and things like that. It's the beauty of the internet and the digital world we're living in. It's like, yeah, I've, I've been just amazed with our podcast and, and various things from clinicians reaching out from every corner of the globe. It's been very cool to, to see. And um, I mean, you should be proud of the impact you're having like globally, truly with being able to spread this information and hopefully start helping, not just like you said, patients, you're helping a lot of clinicians who may be in a rural area who aren't, you know, haven't been, you know, up to date with this type of stuff to, I mean, what better way to teach than a patient coming in with some good informed stuff that again, isn't Dr. Google, you know, giving them all sorts of fun information, some good, well-referenced, well-researched information, and then the ability to have those consults. I think that's such a great service. So, so great for you to do that. Um, you also have a podcast, correct? Yes. Yes. Um, it's called the Bendy Bodies with the Hypermobility MD podcast. I started 
another podcast uh, that was around 2018 called Hypermobility Happy Hour. That was my first podcast. And then I started the Bendy Bodies podcast in February of 2020, right before COVID started. And when, when COVID started, I thought, oh my gosh, nobody's driving anymore. Like, you know, are people really going to listen to podcasts? Because the world had obviously changed so dramatically, but it's such a great way to share information and, you know, it's free to the listener. And so it's just a, it's a wonderful way for people to get a lot of that education that I feel like is so incredibly important. So, so yeah, I started that podcast, um, you know, back, well, I guess that would be three and a half years ago. And, and it's, you know, evolved over time, like I imagine yours has as well. Um, but it's great because if people ask me questions on social media, I usually say, go check out this episode or in a visit, even I'll say, rather than taking this huge chunk of time, why don't you go check out this episode and we can talk about you know, whatever follow-up questions you have, you know, when we meet next. That's that is so cool. Like we had Andrea Furlan, who's a pain physician up in Toronto, who's got her big YouTube channel. I think she's got 500,000 subscribers and you know, in her script pad, she also will have videos and she's got her residents helping her research future video topics and doing all sorts of things that I think are just amazing to help, you know, clinicians be able to better reach their patients. And again, better be able to reach this information to people who are desperately needed, who may be navigating a challenging journey where they're not getting maybe listened to, heard or understood. And hopefully that kind of sets off a light bulb moment for some folks to finally feel like they're got a, got a good direction to go with it because it can be, you know, very cool to see people have those moments. But I want to respect your time today. I really appreciate you spending some time with us. I had a, uh, I learned a bunch of, in the conversation and really am glad we have folks like yourself out there practicing and helping the, the folks with these kind of conditions who are navigating challenging journeys. So thank you very much. Of course. Oh, I, I'm honored to be invited and it was great chatting with you and I'm happy to come back anytime. Oh, absolutely. Well, we're going to hold you to that. Thing. You heard her say that. So for, we'll probably have her on in the future for sure. Um, but for those of you listening, we'd love if you could subscribe on wherever you're listening on your podcast. If you're watching on YouTube, we'd love if you could subscribe there. That way we can spread this information to somebody else. Somebody else might be struggling with POTS, EDS, um, mass cell activation syndrome. And if they can listen, this might be a change in their, in their world, in their life. So spread the word. Hope you enjoyed the podcast and we will talk to you all next week. 